Uh, Mr. Starker, you were a child prodigy. Do you find that that was advantageous to learning the cello? I was a child prodigy, but I was not an exploited child prodigy, which means that because of the conditions when I was growing up were not quite right for traveling and this kind of thing. So I was considered a child prodigy, but I wasn't concertizing and touring what is customary these days with the child prodigies. In your development, did you find that kind of kickstart helped create the virtuoso you became? Well, the only way I can answer this, because it's a very far-reaching mm -hmm. and very complex issue, I, I was one of the weirdest child prodigies because uh, although I played in public already, sort of in the public at age nine, eight, nine, ten, and eleven, and so on, but I was also teaching at the age of eight. My first student was assigned to me to teach a six years old, and by the time I was thirteen and fourteen, I had seven, eight students. So, which means that my life was parallel already from the very beginning as a teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, I played uh, some concerts, and I played a great deal of chamber music, and I also, while in high school, I was uh, jobbing, I was playing in orchestras, other schools' orchestras who didn't have a cellist, so it was not what is commonly considered as a child prodigy kind of development. Uh, I am not in general in favor of uh, child prodigies, in spite of the fact that in the last few days as well I've, I've listened to 10 years old, 12 years old uh, cellists who played tremendously well. Mm -hmm. But the uh, usual problem is that when uh, teachers who have those little kids displaying incredible instrumental ability and plus on occasion even uh, the ability to sense, uh, displaying sense of understanding, of musical understanding, they get so fascinated by it that they don't allow the children to grow step by step. Which means or musically? Uh, both ways because they can play already at the age of eight and ten things what grown-ups have difficulty mm -hmm. with, but in the meantime they, uh, as I call it sometimes, they learn to jump without learning how to walk. And that means that uh, I happen to be old-fashioned in the sense that I believe in step-by-step -step development mm -hmm. and it's difficult with uh, the parents and difficult with some of the teachers who are so delighted and so uh, enthusiastic about the incredible facilities of these kids that they forget to uh, assess that what the future will be for them. Because I'm most of the time when I see these kids, uh, I start uh, wondering that what's going to happen to them when they reach the age of 20, 30, 40. And we all know historically that how many of the great uh, child prodigies disappeared. Mm -hmm. And for me it is because of partly the exploitation and partly the lack of step-by-step -step development instrumentally as well as musically. Uh, you mentioned in your autobiography that you played a concert in Vienna of the Schubert Arpeggioni Sonata and the review was very complimentary until the last sentence when the reviewer said it was as, as if you were sleepwalking. Well, of course, by that time I was, uh, if I remember, 22 years old. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, after the war, where for a year I didn't play the cello at all. And so it was in Vienna then the uh, after effect, so to the mm -hmm. aftershock of the, the war years uh, came. And that brought home the message to me that uh, I think I've written about uh, comparing it to the uh, uh, the bird who doesn't know how to sing but sings beautifully and that mm -hmm. was a kind of a stretch where I felt that I, I had the ability to play uh, surprisingly well the cello and making music as well but it did sound to this man that like as if I would be a uh, sleepwalker and that when my life changed in the sense that I decided that I will not perform until I know exactly what I'm doing. 
So what happened? What did you do? Well, I, I spent sleepless nights on figuring out that if a sound is not right, why is it not right? And if I uh, make uh, a phrase which is cut short or something, that's what, what is wrong? Which means uh, if I, instead of just practicing and eliminating the so-called difficulties of any given piece, I stopped and decided that I must find out what's causing that problem. And in the long run, after a very long lifetime, I only can describe it that I insisted of becoming a professional musician. And I often use the thing that uh, well, there are incredibly gifted dilettants, and unfortunately it's nasty of me to say a great number of the uh, performing artists in the world are basically dilettants. And that means lack of consistency. When the weather is nice, when the stomach feels mm -hmm. good, when the, the wife is nice, then mm -hmm. they play fantastic concerts. And then they can play incredibly bad concerts mm -hmm. that they themselves are mm -hmm. ashamed. But that means for me uh, simply that uh, they are not professionals in the sense who know exactly what they are doing. And if it uh, goes well, why it goes well? And if it goes badly, why does it go badly? And that's what I've spent uh, most of my life of raising professionals. Am I right in saying that your career was perhaps somewhat unusual in that after the war you moved to the United States and played in the Dallas Symphony, the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, and the Chicago Symphony, and were able to come out of this uh, orchestral career to become a soloist? Is that well, it's not order? quite uh, the uh, the order of uh, it's not quite the same because uh, before coming to the United States, uh, I was a concertizing artist and already made my recordings, uh, mm -hmm. uh, first recordings in France. So, which means I was a soloist a from soloist. childhood on, except it was interrupted, and precisely with what I said before, that's the reason I stopped because when I was in Paris before going to the States, I was offered. Uh, management contract in the United States, but I didn't feel that I'm ready because I was not quite the professional I intended to become. And then the uh, orchestra experience, which for me was the most enriching experience because I played all the major works of the uh, orchestra literature, mm -hmm. the opera literature, plus I had Heifetz in front of me uh, playing and recording and the Rubinsteins and all the others, and uh, playing with the Bruno Walters, Fritz Reiners, Anser Mays, all the greatest conductors mm -hmm. of the time. That was the best learning experience that any musician could possibly have. And that is partly the reason why I insist on teaching, because I was lucky enough to have those experiences mm -hmm. of learning it from the source. source. When I was I think 12 or 13 years old, I played uh, Beethoven sonatas with somebody who was uh, a Liszt student. Mm -hmm. So which means, and Liszt are new, or the Beethoven, I think, if I remember well. So which means uh, we pretend mm -hmm. we, that we have a direct line mm -hmm. to, not just to hell, but to heaven as well. So. <laughs> How do you keep that repertoire fresh after a thousand performances? Well, it's a... Uh, the idea is usually, a, and I assume it's most of the performing artists, uh, are following that same rule that if you play something over and over again, you try not to play the same way. Mm. And that is a part of the professionalism which I believe in, that you have to learn uh, and prepare yourself for a variety of ways of approaching a certain piece. And it depends on physical condition, it fits the, the conditions surrounding you, that if it's raining, you take a different approach when it's dry weather. And uh, you somewhat uh, play a piece differently when you play it in the afternoon or play it in the evening. And so it's the attempt of trying to recreate the pieces whenever you have to uh, perform it, because that's a certain issue involved here. When uh, concert artists are touring, they make the uh, commitment to certain concerts 
for years in advance. Mm -hmm. Now, how in God's name do you know how you're going to feel that particular night to play that particular piece, which you decided on as a program because it was agreed by the management and mm -hmm. orchestras or uh, chamber music soci societies, how uh, that well, you're going to feel like playing that. Mm -hmm. That's where the professionalism comes in, and then you choose and hope to present the same work differently whenever you are called upon to do so. Do you have favorites? Uh, the closest composer to me, uh, I've said it a number of times, was Brahms. Brahms, uh, I can only describe it that Brahms never bores me. Mm -hmm. There's no question about uh, Bach and Beethoven and uh, Mozart, but there are times when I'm not absolutely dedicated to hear all Bach's works. The cello suites are my favorite, yes, that's understood. Mm -hmm. But uh, favorites, usually we say that uh, no cellist uh, can live without Dvorak. So the amount of times, the number of times, because no matter where we went, it was always uh, Dvorak concerto us primarily. I tried in my life not to make a living on Dvorak and insisted on some seasons. I had 18, 19 different orchestra works that I played. That's partly as in answer what you asked mm -hmm. before, how do you keep um, keep fresh. Uh, fresh or something, that I tried always to vary as much by programs, which is a problem on occasion because when you start uh, asking conductors to, to play a, a work which is not in their repertory, then some of them hesitant to learn a new piece and so on. But then when it's a world premiere or premiere hero, then, then they usually more inclined to learn it. But I insisted in my life of trying to play as wide a repertory as possible.